So what drives young Muslims to have such anger and indeed hatred sometimes to the West? To some it goes to the very heart of the teachings of the Quran. To others, Islam is a religion of peace. Yet it is undeniable that young, mostly men, have picked up arms to fight against Western forces. And as we've seen in Boston or in Woolwich, those attacks can strike very close to home. Joining me now is Uthman Bada from the Islamic group Hizbut Tahrir. Nice to have you here, Uthman. When we hear about alienation and we hear about men being radicalised, what drives that? I think there's a number of factors, but I think fundamentally uh, the fact I'd, I'd like to point out because it's ignored mm. um, is the, the, the policies of state, both foreign and domestic, but in origin foreign, I mean, particularly because as far as Muslims are concerned, there's a concept of a, a, a transnational ummah, a nation. Mm -hmm. And so therefore something which happens to Muslims in Iraq or Afghanistan is not something that's foreign. And this, this idea is perhaps So if it strikes to, one Muslim, it strikes all Muslims? That's right. That's right. That's the concept um, uh, politically as well as spir spiritually amongst Muslims. And, and yet we see conflict between Muslims themselves well, as well. But you have that, of course. Sunni and Shia. Of course. I mean, Muslims are human. They're fallible. Hmm. But this is the idea which is a bit different from the Western conception around nation states. Uh, but fundamentally, I mean, the point is you're gonna, if you're going to continuously for such a long period go to war, uh, support dictators that make life hell on earth for people, drone attacks that kill children. You know, this is what this is what in origin creates the alienation and the the anger, the grievance. What, how does that manifest itself in people though who are no longer living in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Yemen, Syria, whichever country you want to name, who have moved to countries like Australia, the United Kingdom, um, in the United States, the Boston bombings recently as well. How do they then? also feel that sense of alienation and are they not separated from that by no longer living in those countries? No, they're not. This is the whole point. Mm. I mean, if, if we're going to look at this through the, the sort of modern secular liberal lens, then we look at it like that, but it's just not like that in the Islamic conception. Um, it, it is seen to be one body and that's the way that uh, Muslims look at it. Um, Besides, I mean, it's not if this, if this was something that was limited to one country or a few countries, mm. it's so broad. Um, and sometimes people find it difficult to relate. Uh, you know, if I could, if I could present just a couple of specific examples so people can relate, we saw in the 1990s, you know, sanctions in Iraq uh, mm -hmm. by Western states that resulted in half a million children mm -hmm. losing their lives because of hunger and malnutrition because of those sanctions. In Basra, even now, in places in Iraq, uh, cancer incidences of cancer, birth defects are at epidemic proportions because of depleted uranium shells used by the Americans and the British. So the point is, there's, there's so many examples, but we're told, you know, the, the Muslim perpetrators are savages, they're dehumanized, they're psychopaths, whereas people like Madeleine Albright, who said that those half a million killed were a worthy price for the American agenda, and they continue to lead Western nations and uh, it's business as usual. But w when you see killings like the one in Woolwich, which was graphic, um, mm. it was vicious, and we saw the alleged perpetrators coming to the camera, blood on their hands, still wielding the weapons. What does that say to you? Do you look at that and see that as understandable, or do you reject that as, a, as an act of violence? Well, I see, I see two things here. Again, for, to keep the focus in the right spot, number one, I see that the condemnation should be for the British policymakers who, because of the oppression of Muslims abroad, have brought violence, not for the first time, to the streets of Britain. And number two, it's, now it's about the media and the portrayal and where they put the focus, because there was also a very gruesome and brutal killing mm. in the streets of London of a 75-year-old elderly Muslim man, just this month as well, knife put right through his, through his back, came out through the front, um, in what was believed to be a racially motivated attack, because he was Muslim. And, but I, I, I can wager, if I were a betting man, that most of the Yules would not know about that or about the British soldier in Afghanistan in 2011 who killed a 10-year-old child because he was pestering him for chocolate, put a bayonet straight through his kidney. So it's, the point is, who decides mm. what's the folks? Who decides that we find out every minute, minute detail? We're given photo family shots of the British, of the, of the Western victims. Muslim victims are just statistics. But uh, one thing I think, just trying to sort of understand the motivation here, uh, yeah, uh, any, any death like that is senseless. Any death like that is, is sure. a tragedy. Yep. Um, but is there... I'm looking at the, the, ju the justification for this. For people who are brought up in Britain, who have been living there as apparently these, these perpetrators were, yep. to carry out that, that sort of, of an attack, uh, you're not saying that that is justified? That, that sort of killing 
is, is excusable? Well, we've been quite clear that innocent people cannot be targeted. Mm. But this is the whole point. I, I, I mean, the reason, if someone asks, if you ask me, do I condemn the attack, I would say no, not because I condone it or I justify it, but because I reject this discourse which puts the focus on disempowered individuals and lets those in powerful institutions get away scot-free. That but holds the entire Muslim communities uh, responsible, asking them to condemn and apologise and distance, um, and ignores the greater, greater injustice. I reject the discourse. Mm. It's not the act that is justified. It's not, but uh, it's the focus that I think is is unfair and unjustified. Yeah, in fact. Uh, uh, is are the two worlds, if you like, incompatible? Islam and the West. For people living in, and you're living here in Australia, uh, living in in the West, following Islam, Islamic values, feeling that anger, as you say, to the attacks that have gone on in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. Does that make the two incompatible? Well, it's not, it's not incompatible that Muslims and non-Muslims live together. Uh, it's, it's happened in the Muslim world for centuries. Um, it's happened in the West. The, the issue really is not on the individual level, it's on the level of, of societies and systems. And at that level, yes, there is, there is a, uh, an incompatibility between Islam and, and secular liberalism, if you will. Mm. But that's not something strange. It's, it's the same as you know, capitalism and communism. You can't have a capitalist slash communist state. You can have capitalists and communists living together, whether in America or in the Soviet Union or in China, but you can't have the two. And, and this is the struggle that defines what's happening in the Muslim world. What we're saying is Muslims should be allowed their own political destiny, but Western policymakers are saying, no, Sharia is, uh, is a red line, even in the Muslim world. It's mm. a red line here, of course, right? And, 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 and values are imposed on mm. Muslims even here, causing further alienation. Um, but even in the Muslim world, we're dictated to and it said, no, Sharia is a red line, and we're going to intervene to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, in the eyes of many people, the red line also would be hacking someone to death in the street who sure. had nothing to do ostensibly with that. He was a symbol. The soldier was a symbol of Western imperialism or Western aggression or however you want, you want to put that. But that also is a red line. Well, it is a red line, but there's the point. If, we, if we're concerned about the violence, as we should be, Right? And I understand the outrage because it's a human condition to be averse to these sort of shocking images. But if it's about the violence, then why this fallacious narrative where uh, you know, uh, Muslim violence, which exists but pales in comparison to Western violence, yet we're told, oh, look at those primitive violent Muslims and the problem is sought in Islam and the Quran. Why aren't we looking for the problem in secular liberalism? Why aren't we putting the US Constitution or the works of the Enlightenment uh, scholars under the, under the telescope to find out where the violence is coming from. You know, who's killed more people? Mm. Whose terrorism uh, uh, dis creates more destruction, social and economic impact? If, if it's really just about a, a body count, that's clearly an argument that could go on forever. But where do, how do you move forward in this debate? When people are looking for answers, the Islamic community is looking for answers as well uh, to try to put an end to this sense of alienation this that manifests itself in this sort of violence how do you move forward well you move forward by dealing with the root causes stop interfering in the muslim world stop dictating stop imposing your values allow the muslim world its own political destiny and once you allow that muslims will move on um, but if you keep interfering if you cr keep creating the oppression that's what's going to happen this is a list of children not women, not men, children killed by Obama's drones in Yemen and Pakistan. It's four pages long. Mm. Right? So, I mean, if you, you're killing families, you're killing people, and then you don't expect a reaction. Yet the policy, and this is about going forward, right? Because who's the most influential? It's not me or you, mm. although you're in the media, you're probably more information than I am. But it's policymakers, end of the day. And policymakers in the West still do not even have Western foreign policy on the table of discussion in counterterrorism policy. And mm. we're not going anywhere. Well, well, it's good to be able to have you on here and have this discussion. I hope we can continue to have this sort of dialogue as well. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. I appreciate up. it.